An introduction to nuclear chemistry going to be the topic in this first lesson in a chapter on nuclear chemistry. My name is Chad and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, in addition to high school and college science prep, we also do MCAT, DAT, and OAT prep as well. I'll be sure to leave a link in the description below for where you can find those courses. Now, this lesson is part of my new general chemistry playlist. I'm still releasing several lessons a week for at least another couple of weeks. Uh, so if you'd like to be notified every time I post a new lesson or for when I put new playlists together, uh, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. So we have finally reached a chapter dealing with the nucleus. All the rest of general chemistry has largely dealt with the electrons. So all of chemical reactions is just a reorganization of the electrons. We're making bonds and breaking bonds and bonds are made of electrons. But in this chapter, we finally get to deal with the nucleus and most students find this the most fascinating chapter in all of general chemistry, go figure. Uh, but we're going to be dealing with the protons and neutrons inside of that nucleus, not with the electrons. In fact, we'll largely be ignoring all the electrons in the electron cloud of an atom. Now, there's some nuclear particles we've got to talk about real quick before we can dive too far. And so some of these will be familiar, like the proton and the neutron. And these are their symbols in this context, P for proton, N for neutron. And just a reminder, your upper number is the mass number. So it's typically the number of protons and neutrons combined, rounded to the nearest whole number. So, which is a number of protons and neutrons, I guess that shouldn't make a difference. Uh, and then your lower number is the atomic number. So, and that atomic number usually corresponds to the number of protons if we're talking about a nucleus, but it also just simply corresponds to the charge for some of these nuclear particles. All right, so we see with the neutron, we got a mass number of one and no charge. So in the proton, then a mass number of one, but also a charge of plus one, so uh, an atomic number of one. Now this top one here might be new, and this is an alpha particle. An alpha particle is composed of two protons, two neutrons. So it's got an atomic number of two corresponding to those two protons, but a mass number of four corresponding to the total of two and two, two protons plus two neutrons. Now it turns out this alpha particle is the equivalent of a helium nucleus. And you might see it written this way as well. These are equivalent expressions here. And notice I said it's the same thing as the equivalent of a helium nucleus, not a helium atom. And the big difference again is the electrons. So an alpha particle does not have any electrons. A helium atom would, but a helium nucleus does not. So that's why it's the equivalent of the nucleus. So we'll work our way down here, and this one's going to be new as well. This is a beta particle. A beta particle is functionally equivalent to an electron. In fact, you might see it also written this way, although more commonly if we write it like this, we actually do mean electron. So, but these are functionally equivalent. They have a charge of negative one, so, and then a mass number of zero. And one thing you should realize is that the mass isn't really zero. It's just, you know, 0. 0.000 something AMUs. It's some small fraction of an AMU, like one 1843rd of an AMU or something like that. And if you round that to the nearest whole number, that's gonna round to zero. But I just want you to realize that it's not exactly zero because the exact mass here will be important in a second. So and then this guy right here is what we call a positron. Not something you'd normally encounter, but you will encounter in nuclear chemistry, and it is just essentially a positively charged electron. So kind of the antiparticle of an electron, but positively charged here. So, uh, and then finally we get the gamma ray. <clears throat> and this gamma ray is not a particle. All the rest of these are particles, but this guy is the highest energy uh, electromagnetic radiation. So that's why we're saying ray and not particle. So. And as such, he really does have zero rest mass. We encountered this earlier in the semester back in chapter six in dealing with the entire spectrum of electromagnetic radiation. We'll see him once more. It's often given off as nuclear radiation. Not good stuff, truth be told, but it really does have a rest mass of zero. So if you notice, if we start at the top, we've got uh, a mass somewhere in the ballpark of four, uh, of course, one of the mass number. So, and then it turns out a neutron is going to be just slightly heavier, like 1.00866 AMUs versus 1.00726 AMUs, but both round to one for a mass number. So, and then again, that beta particle is some tiny fraction of an AMU. And then finally you get to the gamma ray and it really is a rest mass of zero. And so these are getting lighter as you go down. And it turns out that means they're going to have more what we call penetrating power. So from a nuclear radiation perspective. So it turns out if you're gonna get hit with nuclear radiation, your barrier of protection is your skin. And so it turns out that these gamma rays have the highest likelihood of making it through your skin, and these alpha particles have the lowest likelihood of making it through your skin. Now both of them might make it through your skin, but maybe just a larger fraction of the 
uh, gamma rays are going to make it through your skin than the alpha particles. And the idea is kind of this. So atoms are pretty uh, porous. They're made of lots of empty space. You've got a nucleus, a small nucleus in the center, and these tiny electrons going around, but it's mostly empty space. And put a bunch of these atoms together, there's still just a ton of empty space. And things that are small have a much likelihood of passing right through without you know, hitting an electron or hitting a nucleus, anything of that sort. And so that's why these Gamma rays are the most, much, most, the, the most likely to pass through any sort of material. So it turns out if you want to put up a lead shield to block these, you'd have to put up the thinnest lead shield to block out the alpha particles and the thickest lead shield to block out those gamma rays. So think of it as kind of like a, a volleyball net, you know, a nice porous net. It's got squares about yay big uh, uh, with a mesh. And uh, if I try to throw a volleyball through that net, it's not going to happen. If I try to throw a softball through, well, maybe, maybe it might squeeze through. By the time you go down to a baseball, baseball has a chance of making it through one of those holes. And by the time I go down to, like I say, a small marble, well, most marbles I throw at it are never going to actually hit the net and just pass right through. Same kind of thing here. The smaller the particle or ray, the more likely it can pass through a bunch of atoms. And so if you had a choice and I was going to shoot you with either an alpha particle gun or a gamma ray gun, if there were such a thing, uh, you should choose the alpha particle gun over the gamma ray gun, but you should really choose neither one. Uh, however, if you were to ingest a nuclear poison, there are such things. Uh, so it turns out that the... Uh, Alpha particles, if you've ingested it, they're already inside you. They can cause mega damage. They've already made it past your skin, essentially. So uh, just keep in mind, uh, <laughs> any of these is going to be terrible if you ingest it. So, But if it's got to make it through your skin, so the gamma rays have the best chance of penetrating through your skin, the alpha particles the lowest chance of penetrating through your skin. Okay, uh, moving on. So looking at your nucleus made of protons and neutrons, and you can deduce how many of each from a typical nuclear symbol like this. And just as a reminder again, the lower number is your atomic number, and it gives you the number of protons. And so in this case, this is uranium-235, and it's got 92 protons. So, and then the top number is your mass number, and it gives you the sum of the protons and neutrons combined. And so if I just take the top number, which is protons and neutrons, and subtract the bottom number, which is just the protons, the difference would then therefore be just the neutrons. And this equals 143, and so we have 143 neutrons in uranium-235. Now I'm calling this uranium-235, and that is a specific isotope for uranium. So it turns out uranium, not all uranium atoms weigh 235, some weigh 238. And that's actually, it turns out, the two predominant isotopes, but there are some uh, much less prevalent others out there as well. And so uh, the isotopes identified by its mass number, if I have a uranium atom that weighs 235, I call it uranium-235, or at least has 235 total protons and neutrons. If I have a uranium atom that has a total of 238 protons and neutrons, so it will then, I'll call it uranium-238. And notice, whether it's uranium-235 or 238, it's still going to have an atomic number of 92. The protons won't change. It is the number of neutrons that would be different. We see here that uranium-235 has 143 neutrons, whereas uranium-238 would have an additional three, 146 neutrons instead. So that's your difference in isotopes. Now, one other thing that kind of brings to mind then is that you should distinguish between the mass number and the atomic mass on the periodic table. So if we take a look at uranium over here, the atomic mass is 238.0289. And it turns out that atomic mass, as a reminder, is the average of the masses of all the naturally occurring isotopes. And it's a weighted average. It takes into account their relative abundances and stuff like this. So, so when you see a, an individual isotope, don't think that you have to look over here to see how much it weighs or anything like this. So this atomic mass is an average of all the isotopes. So if you want the individual mass of an individual isotope, that's usually something you've got to look up in tables online or something to be provided for you. It's not something you have to look here for. Now, if you just have some you know, average sample of uranium or something like that, well, on average, any one of those atoms would on average weigh this much right here, and that already accounts for those individual uh, relative abundances and stuff like this. But again, if you just have one atom or one nucleus, even more specifically in this chapter that you're looking at, so then you need to look up its nuclear mass in some sort of table, not on the periodic table. So because then again, these mass numbers don't necessarily correspond to what's on the periodic table. That's an average, an atomic mass. All right, so if you take a look at the nucleus, so you, uh, something very puzzling about a nucleus that you probably haven't thought about till now because we just never brought it up. So, but living in a nucleus is a bunch of protons and neutrons. Now, the neutrons we don't have a problem with. They're neutral. They don't have a charge. 
but the protons are all positively charged. So why are they hanging out together? Don't they experience an electrostatic repulsion to each other? Well, they do. So, but it turns out if they're all gonna hang out together in that nucleus, there must be a force that is stronger than the electrostatic repulsion between them. And it turns out there is. And at short distances, this force operates and they didn't get creative in naming it. They just called it the strong force or the strong nuclear force. Go figure, but that's actually what's holding the protons and neutrons in a nucleus together. So we'll find out that the energy associated with this force in the last lesson in this chapter is called the nuclear binding energy. And it's the energy associated with that strong nuclear force. Cool, so that's about the introduction we need. We now need to talk about some trends in radioactivity and how you identify whether or not uh, you'd expect an element to be more likely to be radioactive or less likely to be radioactive. Okay, so we're gonna talk about some trends in radioactivity, and one, sh one thing you should realize, there's an inverse relationship between radioactivity and stability. So when you have a relatively stable nucleus, you don't expect it to be radioactive. When you have a relatively unstable nucleus, it's more likely to undergo radioactive decay, so it's more likely to be radioactive. So that's kind of that inverse relationship. And so if you want to identify whether or not uh, an element's going to be either stable on one hand or unstable and radioactive on the other hand, we do have some trends. And it turns out, first thing you want to look for is atomic number. And Z here stands for charge, which is going to correspond to atomic number for a nucleus typically. And so uh, the atomic number is all larger than 83. So 84 and up, they're all radioactive, every last nucleus. And so if you look on the periodic table, so one thing you notice starting at number 84 is you start seeing a lot of the elements that are heavier than this all having their atomic masses in parentheses. Now, not all of them do. So if you look at it, but a lot of them do. So a lot of them down here all have their atomic masses in parentheses. And again, not all of them, but a lot of them. And it's convenient that though this, this trend starts at 84. Now, there's a couple that are lighter over here and stuff like that. So... But my big point is this, if you look at a periodic table, it'll help you remember this first part. Because starting at number 84 and larger, a lot of them have this in parentheses. And the idea is that these are so radioactive, they're undergoing radioactive decay so fast that we struggle to actually get an accurate mass of them. Because when they uh, undergo radioactive decay, they often get lighter. And then all of a sudden you've got a, an impurity of what they've turned into into some other element and things of a sort. So getting an accurate mass is very difficult. And so for all the ones in parentheses, they're all, they're, you know, undergo very rapid radioactive decay. So for ones that aren't in parentheses, not necessarily the case. However, just again, from 80, atomic number 84 and larger, whether they're in parentheses or not, all of them are radioactive, every last one of them. And so for atomic numbers greater than 83 or greater than or equal to 84, however you want to look at it, they're all radioactive. And so if I want to give you a question on a test that says, which of the following is most likely to be radioactive? Well, if I give you any that are atomic number 84 or larger, well, then they're radioactive, period. No, there's no exceptions. All of them are radioactive. All right, next thing we want to look at. Even numbers of protons and neutrons are more stable. So it turns out if you have an even number of protons and an even number of neutrons, you're much more likely to be stable. So if you've got an odd number of protons and or an odd number of neutrons, that all of a sudden leads you towards the side of being unstable and more likely to be radioactive. In fact, if you have an odd number of protons and an odd number of neutrons, there's a really high likelihood you're radioactive. In fact, we only know of five naturally occurring isotopes that have an odd number of both and are stable, like nitrogen-14 is one of them. The most abundant isotope of nitrogen is nitrogen-14. Nitrogen-14 has seven protons and seven neutrons. Those are both odd numbers, and yet it is still stable. But that is definitely one of the major exceptions to the rule. He's one of only five isotopes with both an odd number of protons and an odd number of neutrons that is not radioactive. So that might be the next thing we look at. So once you look at and see that your atomic, you know, look for any atomic numbers 84 or higher, then look and, you know, look at your number of protons and neutrons. If they're both odd numbers, odds are it's going to be radioactive. Next thing we're going to look at is what we call the N over Z ratio. So N stands for neutrons, Z again is the charge of the nucleus, which stands for the number of protons. And this N over Z ratio uh, often has a very indicative value. And so it, it turns out all the way from atomic number one all the way to atomic number 20 with calcium, it turns out having an N over Z ratio equal to one So all the way up to calcium, if you're, 
So notice atomic number less than or equal to 20 means all the way up to calcium. Your N over Z ratio wants to be essentially exactly one. And if it's exactly one, much more likely to be stable. And the further it is away from one, the less likely it is to be stable. So it turns out you can graph this on what we call the belt of stability. You plot the number of neutrons to the number of protons. And if you look all the way up to atomic number 20, you see this perfect one-to-one -one ratio, so your slope is equal to one. But it turns out as you get to higher than atomic number 20, this slope starts to increase. So, and they call this the belt of stability. And if you look at all, if you plot at all the stable nuclei, or you know, I shouldn't even solve the stable ones, but if you, uh, we'll start with the stable ones. If you plot at all the stable nuclei, you'd find out they hug this line in a narrow band. It gets a little wider at the top here, but it's a fairly narrow region of space. And these are where the stable nuclei are more likely to be found. So, and then you find the ones that deviate out here and stuff like this and you can tell that they're gonna be unstable. In fact, we can get a little more than that. We'll, we'll allude to this again in the future, and we'll kind of look at this belt of stability and be able to conclude what nuclear decay route they're likely to undergo in an attempt to get closer back to being on this belt of stability. So, but this neutron to proton ratio, again, one to one for elements uh, up to calcium, so atomic number 20 and lower, and it turns out it's gonna gradually increase from there, which is a little bit tricky, because like, again, for calcium, you want that exact ratio to be one, but say for iron here, maybe it's it's gonna be like 1.05. And by the time you get all the way down to here like uranium, it might be 1.6, but it gradually increases. So if I said, well, what should it be for say ruthenium? Well, somewhere between one and 1 1.6. <laughs> so, but getting an exact number, that's not so easy. And so if they're gonna ask you anything regarding this N over Z ratio, because anything above calcium, it's hard for me to get you an exact number and stuff like this. What they're more likely to do then is just ask you for atomic, something regarding this N over Z ratio for you know, atomic number 20 or less. That way it has to be exactly one as the ideal. So, but any bigger element, because I, you know, unless I give you what the ideal should be, there's no way for you to kind of know what that's supposed to be, just a range. So just keep that in mind. And then finally, number four is the least likely to be tested upon. And it's not that it's not important, it just requires you to memorize something and it's called magic numbers. So it turns out there are magic numbers of protons and or neutrons. So, and if an, uh, a nucleus has these magic numbers of either protons and or neutrons, it's more likely to be stable. And so these magic numbers are like two, eight, what else we got on there? 20, 28, so on and so forth. So, and usually the professors aren't gonna make you memorize these. And if they don't make you memorize these, if they don't provide them, that's usually not something they can test you on. So. As a result, though, uh, I wouldn't waste your time memorizing these magic numbers. I just want you to be aware of these magic numbers. They do exist. So if you take a look at something like oxygen 16, the most stable nuclear, uh, most stable isotope of oxygen, we've got multiple reasons to explain why in the world it is so stable. So if we take a look, so atomic number is eight, so it's got eight protons. So and if you take 16 minus eight, you're gonna find out it's got eight neutrons. And so if we look here, well, first off, it's got an atomic number less than 83. Okay, not bigger than 83. So, and the number of protons and neutrons are both even numbers. They're also equal. That way, eight over eight gives an N over Z ratio of exactly one. And then eight happens to be one of these magic numbers. By every metric we have, we can see that oxygen 16 should be a very stable isotope, and indeed it is. It is not radioactive. Cool, so that's these trends in radioactivity. And again, if you're gonna be tested on these, these top three are definitely much more likely for something you just see. So and some professors won't emphasize this N over Z ratio too much. Some will emphasize it to a significant degree. It's really up to you. But again, I will allude to this N over Z ratio and this belt of stability a couple lessons down the road when we start looking at some of these nuclear decay processes. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, a like and a comment letting me know are pretty much the best things you can do to support the channel. And if you are looking for nuclear chemistry practice or general chemistry practice in general, take a look at my general chemistry master course. Lots of extra practice in addition to the videos and the study guides. I'll leave a link in the description. A free trial is available. Happy studying.